Let me ask you a deceptively simple question. What would happen if companies understood their own employees better than they understand their customers? And it's a deceptively simple question because we intuitively know both the answer and the benefits. It's actually why Amazon does such a good job of showing us what we're interested in, why Facebook curates our newsfeed for individual relevance, and why applications like Spotify and Netflix are actually differentiated on algorithms that are learning our preferences to customize our experiences. In fact, at home, we have choice, and so we choose to do business with companies that have really figured out how to personalize our news, shopping, entertainment, travel, and other needs. But then we go into work, and at work, it's all one-size-fits-all policies, processes, and tools. The result is an epidemic that isn't getting nearly enough attention. Now, over the next few days, we're going to hear about some of humanity's most important and complex issues. And whether your issue is climate change, world hunger, education, or anything else, I'm going to propose that a precursor to effectively addressing any of these issues is first addressing this. 70% of workers today are disengaged at work. And it's going to require people at work to solve all these issues. These people will be parts of organizations, and these organizations are going to have managers. And management is a technology. Now, when we think about technology more broadly, we've made incredible progress over the last 100 years. Think about the state of medicine, automotive, aerospace, high tech. Think about the progress we made in the last 100 years. And contrast that with work then and now. In fact, if you, in fact, if you consider the fact that over the last 100 years, technology has radically transformed industries, and you contrast that with the fact that the technology of management has simply not kept pace. In other words, business is rapidly evolving and work is not. If we were to take apart this pie chart and replace the word email with memo, this could represent the life of a worker one century ago. And it's frustrating because we all know what a great day feels like, a day where you're able to keep the most important thing, the most important thing, that indescribable feeling, that sense of accomplishment that comes from having spent a day in the state of flow that we all love. These processes, they leave sparse time for people to experience the state of flow, and they interrupt us all too frequently. Consider, for example, annual performance reviews, a frustrating relic from our agrarian roots. If I were to ask everybody here what's wrong with them, Everybody here would have an opinion. We'd all be right. 98% of us do them. 97.2% of us think that they suck. And 58% and of the people that design them agree that they suck. <laughs> but we still do them. We still do them. This is what training looked like 50 years ago. This is what training looks like today. It's a little bit unfair because we've put it on a screen, but fundamentally, it's still one-size-fits-all and a point-in-time approach. And organizations today, we're drowning in process. We have process for everything. We have process for planning, a process for budgeting, process for performance reviews, process for approvals. We have process to change process and process to communicate and train and then now change process. It's too much. <laughs> And it's like this plaque that's clogging organizational arteries. Consider the alternative. Process doesn't need to be static, and experience is a good predictor of risk. There's no reason that the hundredth time and the first time that anybody does anything, the process should be the same. The first time is a teachable moment, and a teachable moment is a great opportunity to pair somebody with an expert, to provide a training intervention at a time when they're going to get the practice and feedback they need to learn. But as people demonstrate competence, can't we relax the bureaucracy and increase the speed? And this is infuriating because we've solved this problem in our personal lives. At home, we're used to technology acting like a coach and helping us. Who in this room hasn't used a mapping application to coach you on how to go anywhere new the first few times? We rely on health trackers uh, to help us achieve our fitness goals, or in my case, gently nudging me to eat less, move more, sleep, and smile. In our research for the Dakota Company, we were encouraged to see a whole new wave of innovation. Companies taking inspiration from the consumer landscape and pulling it into the workplace. Collectively, what all these companies are doing is actually shifting the data lens inward to better enable and empower their own people. Now, in the high-performance world of Formula One racing, Ferrari has actually been doing this for a very long time. They were the first one to build one of these. 
On the screen is a sensing and actuating center, and it will analyze billions of data points in real time during a race so that they can coach the drivers by whispering in their ear things like you can skip the pit or go harder on the brakes. UPS has a program called Orion, where they've collapsed 80 pages of math into a heads-up display that the drivers use to pair their instincts and experience with real-world analytics. The results are that drivers are getting home earlier to see their families. Mileage is down, which is good for profits and the environment. Customer satisfaction is actually up, and they've been saving lives through an insight that they didn't have, which is most accidents were happening during left-hand turns. So what's next? A hundred years ago, Henry Ford said that if he asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Well, email is the ultimate faster horse. Even the language of carbon copy, it's simply a digitized memo. But what makes it worse is it gives us the illusion that we're going faster while actually allowing others to reprioritize us. Fortunately, we're seeing consumer-like consumer applications built for the enterprise space. Companies like Asana in the collaboration space, companies like Meeting Hero and Do.com doing the same in the meeting space, adding structure and feedback loops. So, we hope we've piqued your curiosity because these ideas are universal. We hope that you think about your tools, but more importantly, think about your thinking. Because Einstein said that today's problems cannot be solved with the same thinking that created them. Well, the technology of management got us this far, but it's going to require progressive and empathetic leaders combined with the right tools to re-engage that 70% so that collectively we can work on all the important issues we're going to hear about here on the TED stage. Thank you. Let me ask you a deceptively simple question. What would happen if companies understood their own employees better than they understand their customers? And it's a deceptively simple question because we intuitively know both the answer and the benefits. It's actually why Amazon does such a good job of showing us what we're interested in, why Facebook curates our newsfeed for individual relevance, and why applications like Spotify and Netflix are actually differentiated on algorithms that are learning our preferences to customize our experiences. In fact, at home, we have choice, and so we choose to do business with companies that have really figured out how to personalize our news, shopping, entertainment, travel, and other needs. But then we go into work, and at work, it's all one-size-fits-all policies, processes, and tools. The result is an epidemic that isn't getting nearly enough attention. Now, over the next few days, we're going to hear about some of humanity's most important and complex issues. And whether your issue is climate change, world hunger, education, or anything else, I'm going to propose that a precursor to effectively addressing any of these issues is first addressing this. 70% of workers today are disengaged at work. And it's going to require people at work to solve all these issues. These people will be parts of organizations, and these organizations are going to have managers. And management is a technology. Now, when we think about technology more broadly, we've made incredible progress over the last 100 years. Think about the state of medicine, automotive, aerospace, high tech. Think about the progress we made in the last 100 years. And contrast that with work then and now. In fact, if you, in fact, if you consider the fact that over the last 100 years, technology has radically transformed industries, and you contrast that with the fact that the technology of management has simply not kept pace. In other words, business is rapidly evolving and work is not. If we were to take apart this pie chart and replace the word email with memo, this could represent the life of a worker one century ago.